Greetings, and welcome to Making Your Case, The Art of Persuading Judges. So we're going to be going over this book, and we'll also have, uh, let's see here, Black's Law, Dictionary, 9th edition, close at hand. So if there's any words we don't comprehend right off the bat, we'll make sure we leave no word behind. With that said, let's get started. And if everyone out there can hear me well, please just uh, give a heads up in the chat so we know we're ready to go. And let's move along. So, let's start with the foreword of this book. All right. Published advice on how to persuade judges is as old as the profession of judging itself. Its sources include Aristotle, Isocrates, Demetrius, Cicero, and Quintilian. So, anything fundamentally new contributed by this small volume would probably be wrong. Our purpose is to make the best earlier advice, with perhaps a few suggestions of our own, readily available to the modern practitioner, and to adapt it to the circumstances of modern American litigation. But before we go any further, I just want to remind everyone that this broadcast is strictly for entertainment and educational purposes only. It's not to be construed as professional, personal, lawful, legal, or financial advice in any way, shape, or form. Not to be used in any other way except for the entertainment of this broadcast. Don't do this at home. All right, let's continue. Unsurprisingly, respected authorities on the art of judicial persuasion are not always unanimous. Where there is substantial disagreement with our recommendations, we acknowledge it. Indeed, on four salient points, we've acknowledged disagreements between the two of us, leaving readers to make up their own minds, as they inevitably will. Uh, the two, two of us is referring to the two authors, Anthony Scalia and um, <clears throat> Garner, Brian Garner. We deal here with both written and oral presentation. Since many points that applied to the one apply equally to the other, we have sought to minimize repetition by presenting preliminary sections dealing with the basics of argumentation, knowing your audience, syllogistic reasoning, etc., and then offering separate sections first on brief writing, stressing the peculiarities of that form, and then on to oral argument doing the same. To lighten the journey, we have adopted a conversational style that includes occasional contractions and remarks more flippant or colloquial than one would normally encounter in a legal commentary. The reader, who feels that some of these indulgences fall short of the formality and sobriety expected of a jurist, should attribute all of them to the other author <laughs> and assume that they have been included under protest. <laughs> Nice, nice disclaimer there, and I will, uh, I will second that for for me. There it is, Anthony Scalia and Brian uh, A. Garner. All right, let's get down to the introduction. Judges can be persuaded only when three conditions are met, and as we remember from our maxims of law, conditions are regarding situations that are not certain. So when situations, the outcomes are not certain, there's going to be conditions. Let's see what these three conditions are. One, they must have a clear idea of what you're asking the court to do, the action, right? Two, they must be assured that it's written within the court's power to do it, right? Three, after hearing the reasons for doing what you are asking and the reasons for doing other things or doing nothing at all, they must conclude that what you're asking is best, both in your case and in cases that will follow. So important to think about this, the considerations that judges have. They want to see a clear idea of your action, what you're asking the court to do, what order they're going to issue, right? They must be assured that it's within the court's power to do it. So you need to assure them. You're going to ask them to do something. You're going to assure them that it's within their power to do it within the court, with your standing and jurisdiction, etc. And 
<clears throat> after hearing the reasons for doing what you're asking and the reasons for doing other things or doing nothing at all, right? So that's what you're, uh, you're asking the court to do. They must conclude that what you're asking is best, both in your case and in cases that will follow. So now we have our conditions. Let's continue. To provide the reasons that will persuade the court to conclude in your favor, you must know what motivates the court. And that's not always easy to discern, to be sure. Following precedent is a concern for all judges, especially in the lower courts. So you must always seek to persuade the court that the disposition you urge is required by prior cases, or at the very least, is not excluded by them. <clears throat> greetings, greetings, El Perro, Lord Wizard. Glad you can make it. Uh, we're going through a, uh, a a great book that's uh, written by, uh, I guess, a, a prominent justice, we could say, of the Supreme Court that's departed, and uh, a colleague of his. And it's a rather uh, interesting perspective. Uh, I can't say that I share all the views that this justice has had in his rulings over his uh, tenure on the court. However, I find there's going to be some value in what we're going to glean from this reading. Let's continue. Beyond stare decisis, however, it becomes a matter of some speculation. By the way, stare decisis is your, your case precedence, right? Your prior cases. <clears throat> it becomes a matter of some speculation what motivates a particular judge. Hmm. In a question of first impression, to be resolved within a court's common law powers, all judges would agree that the decision must be driven by one, fairness to the litigants, and a socially desirable result in the case at hand, and two, adoption of a legal rule that will provide fairness, socially desirable results, and predictability in future cases. Back to that third condition. <clears throat> How much weight a particular judge may give to one or two or to their subparts may vary but all judges will surely give some weight to all those considerations. And you can be confident that you're not wasting your time in addressing them. Fairness to all the litigants in a socially desirable result in the case at hand and the adoption of a legal rule that will provide fairness, socially desirable results, and predictability in future cases. So two important considerations to have. When you're writing and the more time you spend on them as our author has suggested here it's not wasting your time in addressing them let's continue but constrained common law decision making is an increasing rarity as we know courts are usually confronted with interpreting a governing text whether a constitutional provision a statute an agency regulation or a municipal ordinance and in these cases, what motivates a judge cannot be so readily determined. Some judges believe that their duty is quite simply to give text its most natural meaning in the context of related provisions, of course, and applying the usual canons of textual interpretation without assessing the desirability of the consequences that meaning produces at the other extreme are those judges who believe it is their duty to give the text whatever permissible meaning will produce the most desirable results. Most judges will probably fall somewhere between these two extremes, perhaps adopting the most natural meaning except when policy consequences affect an area that they consider particularly important, environmental protection or sex discrimination. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or perhaps consulting policy consequences, only when the most natural meaning is not entirely clear. Ah, unless you know for sure what sort of judge you're dealing with, you're well advised to argue, if possible, both most natural meaning, natural laws, common law, and 
policy consequences come permissible meaning. As we'll discuss in some detail, your arguments must make logical sense. Your legal and factual premises must be well-founded, and your reasoning must logically compel your conclusion. See this, your reasoning must compel your conclusion. But while computers function solely on logic, human beings do not. All sorts of extraneous factors, emotions, biases, preferences, can intervene, most of which you can do absolutely nothing about, except play on them if you happen to know what they are. An ever-present factor, however, and one that you can always influence, is the human proclivity to be more receptive to argument from a person who is both trusted and liked. All of us are more apt to be persuaded by someone we admire than by someone we detest. In the words of Isocrates, the man who wishes to persuade people will not be negligent as to the matter of character. He will apply himself, above all, to establish a most honorable name among his fellow citizens. For who does not know that words carry greater conviction when spoken by a man of good repute? Aristotle further noted that character makes a special difference on disputed points. <clears throat> we believe good men more fully and more readily than others. This is true. Where exact certainty is impossible, and opinions are divided, your objective in every argument, therefore, is to show yourself worthy of trust and affection. Trust is lost by dissembling or conveying false information, not just intentionally, but even carelessly, by mischaracterizing precedent to suit your case, by making arguments that could appeal only to the stupid or uninformed, <laughs> by ignoring rather than confronting whatever weighs against your case. Trust is won by fairly presenting the facts of the case and honestly characterizing the issues, by owning up to those points that cut against you and addressing them forthrightly, and by showing respect for the intelligence of your audience. As for affection, you show yourself to be likable by some of the actions that inspire trust, and also by the lack of harsh combativeness in your briefing and oral argument. The collegial attitude you display towards opposing counsel, your refusal to take cheap shots or charge misbehavior, your forthright but unassuming manner and bearing at oral argument, and, perhaps above all, your even-tempered good humor. Some people, it must be said, are inherently likable. If you're not, work on it. It may even improve your social life. <laughs> oh boy, social advice from a judge. All right, let's continue. All right, so here we go. General principles of argumentation. Are you guys ready for this? Take notes. I'll leave this on the screen here so we know what we're reading. Be sure that the tribunal has jurisdiction. Know your audience. Hang on, I can't highlight this, but we always have solutions. Give me a second here. There we go. Okay. Be sure the tribunal has jurisdiction. Know your audience. Know your case. Four, know your adversary's case. Five, pay careful attention to the applicable standard of decision. Six, never overstate your case. Be scrupulously accurate. Seven, if possible, lead with your strongest argument. Eight, if you're the first to argue, make your positive case, and then preemptively. 
Nine, if you're arguing after your opponent, design the order of positive case and There's a long list, okay. 10. Occupy the most defensible terrain. 11. Yield indefensible terrain ostentatiously. 12. Take pains to select your best argument. Concentrate your fire. Look at this one's pretty good. Take pains to select your best argument. Arguments. Concentrate your fire. Important. Number 12 here. 13. Communicate clearly and concisely. Make every word tell. Have good uh, style, right? 14. Always start with a statement of the main issue before fully stating the facts. Okay, so this is structure. 15. Appeal not just to rules, but to justice and common sense. 16. When you must rely on fairness to modify the strict application of the law. 17. Understand that reason is paramount with judges, and that overt appeal to assume a posture of respectful intellectual equality with the bench. Restrain your emotions, and don't accuse. Control the semantic playing field. That's interesting. And close powerfully and say explicitly what you think the court should do. All right, let's proceed here. I think you can shut this off. Okay. One, be sure that the tribunal has jurisdiction. Nothing is accomplished by trying to persuade someone who lacks the authority to do what you're asking. Whether it is a hotel clerk with no discretion to adjust your bill, or receptionists who cannot bind the company to the contract you propose. Persuasion directed to an inappropriate, inappropriate audience is ineffective. Once again, persuasion directed to an inappropriate audience is ineffective. So it is with judges, whose authority to act has many limitations. Jurisdictional limitations relating to geography, citizenship of parties, monetary amount, and subject matter. From justices of the peace to justices of supreme courts, judges face as a first task to be sure of their authority to decide the matters brought before them and to issue the orders requested. If they don't have the authority in your case, you don't just have a weak case, you have no case at all. Most weak points in your case will be noted by opposing counsel, giving you a chance to reflect on them and respond. If opposing counsel does not protest a particular point, the defect will often be regarded as waived. But a defect in subject matter jurisdiction is a different matter altogether. An opposing party often has no interest in challenging jurisdiction, being as eager as you are to have the court resolve the dispute. But in many courts, including all federal courts, absence of subject matter jurisdiction, unlike in most other defects, cannot be waived. <clears throat> in some of those courts, including all federal courts, even if no party raises the issue, the court itself can and must notice it. Nothing is more disconcerting or more destructive of your argument than to hear these words from the bench. <clears throat> Counsel, before we proceed any further, tell us why this court has jurisdiction over this case. You need a convincing answer to this question. And preferably a quick and short one, or else you're likely, in the picturesque words of the lawyer's cliché, to be poured out of court. <laughs> Two caveats about jurisdiction. 1. Jurisdictional rules apply in appellate courts as well as in trial courts. The Supreme Court of the United States, for example, has jurisdiction over a state court 
decision involving a federal question only when that decision is final and only when there is no adequate and independent state law ground for the judgment. Two, defendants and appellees are much more likely to ignore our jurisdictional requirements than our plaintiffs and appellants. But jurisdiction is just as important to them, and they must attend to it. The rules of the Supreme Court of the United States require briefs to set forth immediately after the description of the parties, the basis for the court's jurisdiction. Even if the court before which you are appearing has no similar rule, it's a good practice to pretend that it does and to identify the law and the facts that render this original action or this appeal properly before that court. Keep that information handy in case the court asks. Ah, this is nice. Two, know your audience. <laughs> A good lawyer tries to learn as much as possible about the judge who will decide the case. The most important information, of course, concerns the judge's judicial philosophy. What it is that leads this particular judge to draw conclusions, primarily text or primarily policy, as we spoke about earlier. Is the judge strict or lax on stare decisis, prior cases? Does the judge love or abhor references to legislative history? Oh, gosh. The best place to get answers to such questions is from the horse's mouth. Read the judge's opinions, particularly those dealing with matters relevant to your case. Also, read the judge's articles and speeches on relevant subjects. Wow, pretty good uh, advice coming here. Mm. It may surprise you, but many firms keep book on all judges before whom they appear. Yeah. This book includes much more than a biographical sketch, which you might find in Who's Who. Does the judge listen with patience, or does he seem absorbed in other matters or half asleep? Does he treat the government as just another litigant? Or does the government have a preferred or sometimes a prejudiced position? Does he seem impressed by the reputation or prestige of the lawyer making the argument? These and many other impressions are recorded for future reference. It's from Samuel E. Gates. Besides judicial philosophy, learn all you can about how the judge runs the courtroom. Is the judge unusually impatient? If so, you might want to pare down your arguments to make them especially terse and pointed. Is a judge an old school stickler for decorum? If so, you might refer to the opposing counsel as my friend. <laughs> One federal judge had a practice of fining counsel $20, no notice in advance, for placing a briefcase on the counsel table. It's good to know such peculiarities. Some of these courtroom characteristics you can and should observe by sitting in on one of the judge's hearings. Beyond that, however, talk to colleagues at the bar who are familiar with the judge's idiosyncrasies. I think he's referring to the local watering hole. That's a lowercase b, by the way. You see that at the bar, like after work, who are familiar with the judge's idiosyncrasy. Finally, learn as much as you readily can about the judge's background. Say you're appearing before Judge Florence Kubitsky. With a little computer research and asking around, you discover that fly fishing is her passion, <laughs> that her father died when she was only seven, that her paternal grandparents, who were both professors at a local college, took charge of her upbringing, that she once chaired the state Democratic Party, that she enjoys bridge, and she has been estranged from her, boy, her brother and sister for many years, that he, she graduated from Mount Holyoke College and took her law degree from the University of Michigan, that she's an aficionado of good wines, that her favorite restaurant is the Beaujolais Room, that she was a counsel for a craft union before coming to the bench, and so on. Going in, all these data seem irrelevant to how the judge might decide in your breach of contract case, but you might well find some unpredictable uses for this knowledge over the course of a lengthy trial. 
You might want to stress, for example, that the defective contract performance your client is complaining about violated basic standards of the craft and reflect shoddy workmanship. At the very least, these details will humanize the judge for you so that you will be arguing to a human being instead of a, a chair. Apart from the judge's personal characteristics, there are also characteristics of individual courts. Can the appellate court you are appearing before be relied on to read the briefs before hearing the argument? If not, you might devote more argument time to the facts than you otherwise would, or deal with some legal points that are so basic that you'd normally pass over them in oral argument. Is it the practice of the appellate court to assign the opinion to a particular judge before the case is even argued? If so, you can probably assume less familiarity with facts and issues on the part of other judges, and you might want to lay out your argument in a more rudimentary fashion for their benefit. Is a court notoriously dismissive of higher court precedent? Stress the public policy benefits of your proposed disposition. So we kind of see this pattern here, right? Bear in mind that trial judges are fundamentally different from appellate judges. They focus on achieving the proper result in one particular case, not on crafting a rule of law that will do justice in the generality of cases. And they'll pursue that objective principally through their treatment of the facts if the case is, to be, is tried to the court and discretionary rulings. In most jurisdictions, trial judges are more disposed than appellate judges to strict observance of governing case law, perhaps because their work is subject to mandatory review. So at the trial court level, you are well advised to spend more time on the facts and on the discussion of precedent from the relevant courts, and less time on policy arguments. That's one reason why a good trial brief can rarely be used before an appellate court without major changes. Hmm. Three, know your case. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, have you ever tried buying equipment from a salesperson who didn't know beans about it? Oh, gosh. You might understandably have fled the store. Although lawyers aren't selling equipment, they are selling their cases. I am constantly amazed during Supreme Court arguments to hear an attorney virtually struck dumb by questions from the bench that anyone with any knowledge of the case should have anticipated. It is as if the attorney had become so imbued with the spirit of his cause that he has totally blinded himself to the legitimate concerns that someone else might have in adopting his position. Judges listen to counsel because, at the time of briefing or argument, counsel can be expected to know more about the legal and factual aspects of the case than anyone else. But if it becomes clear that this is not so, Judicial attention will flag. If you're asking about a fact in the record that you're ignorant of or a, clear, a clearly relevant case that you're unfamiliar with and have failed to mention in your brief, don't expect the court to give your argument much weight. Your very first assignment, therefore, is to become an expert on the facts and the law of your case. If you're a senior partner who hasn't the time to do this, Assign the case to the junior partner or associate who knows it best. Okay, I'll do that right away. At the appellate stage, knowing your case means, first and foremost, knowing the record. You never know until it's too late what damage a gap in your knowledge of the record can do. Not only our oral argument, see section 62, but even in your brief. Richard Bernstein of Washington, D.C. tells of a case in which the plaintiff appellees, represented by a prominent firm first retained on the appeal, made the theoretically plausible argument that one reason they should receive an injunction for a patent infringement was that damages were difficult to prove. Unfortunately, as the appellant's reply brief carefully, oh so carefully, explained, the appellee's own expert had told the jury that in this case damages were easy to prove and calculate. 
Needless to say, the appellee did not press a point at our oral argument. Don't underestimate, underestimate the importance of facts. To be sure, you'll be arguing to the court about law, but what law applies, what cases are in point, and what cases can be distinguished depends ultimately on the facts of your case. If you're arguing an appeal, you must have a firm grasp of what facts have been determined below or must be accepted as true, and what facts are still unresolved. Knowing a case also means knowing exactly what you're asking for. Remember we came back to the first of the three conditions, right? And how far short of that mark you can go without bringing back to your client a hollow victory. <laughs> Say a member of an appellate panel asks, Counsel, if we agree with your petition, would you be content with a, remain, with a remand for the lower court to consider X an issue not decided below but and not briefed or argued here? You must know whether your opponent ever raised that issue below. If not, you must insist on outright reversal and entry of judgment in your favor. If you fail to do so, the court may cite your failure as a concession that your adversary hasn't forfeited the issue. If, however, your adversary raised the point, but the lower court didn't reach it, you should graciously concede that remand is a possibility, but go on to explain why the appellate court should reject that disposition, as by showing, for example, that the facts could not possibly support a judgment on that ground. By conceding what must be conceded, you establish your credentials as a reliable and even-handed counselor. And next is four, know your adversary's case. No general engages the enemy without a battle plan based in large part on what the enemy is expected to do. Know the case. Your case must take into account the points the other side is likely to make. You must have a clear notion of which ones can be swallowed, accepted, but shown to be irrelevant, and which must be vigorously countered on the merits. If your brief and argument come first, you must decide which of your adversary's points are so significant that they must be addressed in your opening presentation and which ones can be left to your reply brief or oral rebuttal. <clears throat> of course, a principal brief or argument that is all rebuttal is anathema. At the trial stage, you must initially discern your adversary's positions from the pleadings, the conferences, and discovery, and by using common sense. <clears throat> One thing I want to mention, too, if we could come back to this part here, I noticed. Uh, clear notion of this in the brief. Uh, let's see here. But the most important thing is to be uh, well informed of the record. Here we go. Don't ask the importance of facts, right? So the important thing is to have the records on hand as much as possible. And I think this is uh, where I think I saw it here. Okay, let's get back. I, I digress here. But yes, this the important thing is, <clears throat> as they're outlining here, Okay, so the what ones that can be swallowed of the facts, right? They're going to be made, accepted, but shown to be irrelevant, and which must be vigorously countered on the merits. If your brief and argument come first, then you must decide which of your adversary's points are so significant they must be addressed in the opening presentation. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get back to where we were here. At the trial stage, you must initially discern your adversary's position 
from the pleadings, the conferences, and discovery. And I would also say any pre-discovery FOIAs or any other kind of records that you were able to obtain prior to the uh, trial. And by using common sense, <clears throat> which that would be the FOIA. At the appellate stage, you can rely on what was argued and sought to be proved below. Bear in mind, however, that lawyers tend to develop new arguments and revise their theories as the case proceeds upward. Constantly ask yourself, what would you, what you would argue if you were on the other side? One of the most important considerations, because don't delude yourself. Try to discern the real argument that an intelligent opponent would make, and don't replace it with a straw man that you can easily dispatch. Once again, don't delude yourself. Try to discern the real argument that an intelligent opponent would make, and don't replace it with a straw man that you can easily dispatch. Excellent, excellent advice. And from there, we're gonna take a break on this and stop at number five, where we pay careful attention to the applicable standard of decision. So on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for coming in tonight to uh, review this this book of Making Your Case, The Art of Persuading Judges. And it's uh, been an interesting interesting read. I've already learned some new, uh, new insights into the whole process of pleading, appealing, speaking to the judges in oral and written arguments, and the purpose of all of this. So by looking at where the rubber meets the road, which is the court, it can help us proceed in, in uh, expanding our individual liberties here, because really this is where we're able to enforce it in the most peaceful way. And one of the, the privileges, I guess, of being in the United States of America is that we do have uh, a history of, of jurisprudence, which supports a lot of the principles we're speaking of today. So while they're still here, we should be using them before we lose them. And at that, I would salute you all for being here, showing your interest in exercising your knowledge and, and your ability to, uh, to participate in, uh, in the expansion of our personal liberties. So uh, at that, I want to say I hope to see you all on the next one. As you know, it's a good idea to subscribe because it's uh, hard to get notifications otherwise and find out when the next stream is. But we'll continue on from uh, Section 5 on the next one. And I'll see you all there. Peace out.